Once again, we want to express our appreciation for the invitation to be with you this week and to assist in this effort of the congregation. We're thankful for the good work that was done and the fact that uh, a number, as Robert expressed, a number of doors have been knocked, literature has been distributed uh, concerning the church, invitations to the meeting and such, and we are very thankful for that effort. We're going to be talking about the value of the wearing of the name of, uh, of, of being a Christian and how important it is that we exemplify that in our lives. Whenever we turn to the New Testament, we may note that the name Christian is found in three different passages. Uh, for example, we turn to the book of Acts chapter 11 and verse uh, 26. Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. And as we look at these passages, we're able to see essentially that which is going to help us set the stage for what we're going to be talking about this evening. And we would encourage you to take your Bibles, to study along, to make sure that what we're talking about comes directly from God's Word. But in Acts chapter 11 and verse 26 we read, And when he had found him, he brought him uh, unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. We turn a little bit later on in the same book of Acts to the 26th chapter, and uh, we notice verse uh, 28, Acts chapter 26 and verse uh, 28. Here we read, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. We could pause for just a moment there and think about the tragedy of the words that are found therein. Here is one who was almost convinced to become a Christian. Nothing within the Bible, nothing within history ever reveals to us that he ever obeyed the gospel. Nothing tells us that uh, Agrippa ever turned from his sin and uh, obeyed the gospel. And how tragic that is. And as we think about what the Bible has to say on these matters, we recognize that from the point of his demise to the present hour, I'm sure that he is well aware of the fact that he should have been more than almost persuaded to become a Christian. And then our final reference that we want to center in on is found in the book of 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 16. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 16 where we read, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. In these passages, we see that the word Christian was used to refer to those who were adherents of Christ. These were individuals that had taken upon them, as we've been talking about in this series of meetings, they had taken upon themselves insofar as those that had actually become Christians, as we see in Acts 11 and 26 and 1 Peter chapter 4, these had taken upon themselves the mind of Christ. They had accepted, you might say, the challenge to do so, and had done so. And as we think of this, we find an example for our to do the same thing. To take upon ourselves by the development of the attitude of Jesus Christ, that demeanor uh, that is so important. When we look at this, we recognize that often people are willing to embrace the terminology of the word Christian, but when it comes right down to the idea or the concept of uh, their actually being Christ-like, there's a major difference. As we think of this, we remember how that Jesus had prayed for a unity. In the book of John chapter 17, we notice beginning in verse 20, John chapter 17, and beginning in verse 20 and reading through verse 23, there Jesus prayed, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Verse 22, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, 
I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. It's easily seen in these few verses uh, as we look at and examine the prayer of Jesus here, the great emphasis that He placed upon the unity that ought to be had uh, within the church. And yet, as we look around us today uh, in our world, we recognize that there's a great deal of division. And as that division continues to grow and grow and grow, we're finding that, as Jesus had explained here in this prayer, that there was a value or a purpose for this, that that purpose is not being realized today. We move further to the words of the Apostle Paul, uh, looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. And we see here how that Paul had pled with the Corinthians that they might develop the oneness that is so essential in order to be like unto Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. We often hear it asked, do you really believe that we could all believe the same thing? Well, if we've got the same Bible, why not? You know, we believe uh, in other areas. For example, I would think probably just about everyone in here other than some of the really small children, if I were to ask them what two and two is, uh, we would, starting right here with Ricky, I would get the answer four. And, and we would just move our way through the entire auditorium and we would hear four and four and four and four and four as the answer to the question of what two and two is. Well, when we recognize that, we understand that that is because that there is a mathematical table, if you would, that tells us the truth on that. We can speak the same thing because of the basic principles that are there. We can think of another a number of things that would illustrate what I'm talking about, but the Bible, as we well understand, the New Testament, as we well understand, has been inspired of God. And because of that, then, we recognize how important it is that we grasp the unity that's there, that we do speak the same thing, that we are on, as we hear it said from time to time, we're on the same page. We're believing the same thing because God is not the author of confusion. We can turn just a little bit later here in this same book of 1 Corinthians to the 14th chapter. Uh, and uh, we want to notice uh, as we do so how important it is for us to grasp the simple fact that God is not the author of confusion. Verse 33 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14, 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. Now we need to be challenged as we think about the idea of wearing the name Christian, that as we look at this passage and God not being the author of confusion, we're going to see how that God has emphasized within His Word uh, the principles that are necessary in order for our to be Christians. When we're talking about Christians and our being Christians, we're talking about our being Christ-like. And as such, we're endeavoring, as we study uh, the New Testament Scripture, we're endeavoring to understand, uh, once again, the mind of Christ, the attitude of Christ, the overall demeanor of Christ, if you would, so that we might incorporate it into our lives. Folks, this is something we can do if we will. Sometimes people say, well, I just can't do that. Well, that's not true. We can do what God wants us to do if we will just simply uh, rise to the occasion uh, as uh, we can well understand. Notice with me, for example, the words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. Philippians 4 and verse 13, and, and we need to qualify this passage just a bit when we look at it, but notice what Paul wrote. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. In other words, we can do everything that God would have us to do, uh, not that I might be able to do everything. I can't fly. I can't get up here on this podium and flap my arms and then start off flying across the auditorium. And I can't come and say, well, God must be wrong. Paul must be wrong because after all, he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, you know what? Paul couldn't fly either. We can't fly. 
And as such then, there has to be that qualification, that point of understanding that whatever it is that God tells us to do, whatever it is that God commands us to do in order to take on the mind of Christ, then good people, we can do that. We can incorporate that into our lives so that we can indeed be Christians if we will. We can be Christ-like if we will. But we've got to make the choice. We've got to make the concerted effort. We've got to be willing to do what's necessary in order to become like Christ. It's going to involve some effort on our behalf. It's going to involve some work on our behalf. It's not just going to happen just because we want it to be that way in any sense of, of the word. We also can take note looking at the book of Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to be noticing verses 4 through 6 that uh, as we think about the unity that God would have us to have, which is going to bring about that mindset that God would have us to have. Beginning in verse uh, 3 of Ephesians 4, we read, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We would understand that the word endeavor, of course, would involve some effort, wouldn't it? If you're endeavoring to do something or the other, uh, you're putting forth some effort. Well, we're endeavoring uh, to keep the unity of the Spirit in uh, the bond of peace. And then we see the premise laid forth here concerning how that we might accomplish that. How that we might have the unity that we're talking about. There's one body and one Spirit. Even as you're called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. And Father of all, uh, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now we can dance around this passage all night. We can stay here till this time in the morning uh, trying to escape the meaning of what uh, the Apostle Paul wrote there. But in the end, this time tomorrow morning, it would still say exactly what it says right now. We cannot change what has been given unto us by God. So our lesson this evening is basically directed at those of us who are Christians to make sure that we really are what we claim to be. It's not enough to claim something. I could go in my garage and close the garage door and claim to be an automobile. Anybody in here think that I'm an automobile? Well, of course not. I can make a lot of claims uh, that would be without any foundation at all, without any kind of evidence uh, at all. The simple reality is, is that those claims must be proven. For me to claim that I'm a Christian, uh, there has to be evidence in my life that says that that claim, that statement that I just made, is in actuality the truth. Because if it's not the truth, then I'm not what I'm claiming to be. If I'm not manifesting in my life the traits of Christ that are seen in His life as we examine His life carefully, then I am not like Him. Ricky and I are not alike in some areas. He's taller than I am. Uh, he has different glasses on. Uh, there's some distinct differences between Him uh, and I. And as such, for me to be like him, I would have to be just exactly how tall Ricky is. I have to look up to him when I'm talking to him. Uh, and and uh, I would have to get the same kind of glasses. I'd have to get a uh, suede jacket, I guess that's what that is. I'd have to get all of those things and, get, and put those things on in order for me to be just like him. And if I leave anything out, if I leave anything out, guess what? I'm not like him. The same thing with being a Christian. We've got to look and we've got to examine the life of Jesus Christ. We've got to spend time with the Bible. We've got to spend time with the New Testament. We're examining it. We're looking at it. We're studying it. We're learning what Christ was and did. And then we're going to do it. We're going to incorporate it in our lives. When we think about the name Christian, we understand that it's a worthy name. We understand that in the end there's no greater name that we might take upon ourselves uh, than Christian. We take upon ourselves uh, the name or the description American and we're proud of that. Uh, for those who are here from Texas, 
Uh, if you want to find out how proudful they are about being Texans, just ask them. Uh, they'll be more than happy. Uh, Billy, you're not from Texas. You can't shake your head, no. But the bottom line is, is those that uh, are from Texas often are very prideful of that. And so as such so then, uh, they're going to try to live up to those expectations. They're going to try to live up to what God wants us to live up to. So each of us, as we wear the name Christian, let's make sure we're wearing it appropriately. Let's make sure that we're wearing it the way that God would have us to do. We have to recognize this simple fact uh, as we uh, look at these things. A Christian is more than a baptized person. A Christian is more than a church member. A Christian is more than a worshiper. There's more to it. There are many people today who have been baptized who don't look anything like Christ, and I'm talking about from a spiritual perspective. You stand Christ right here, and you stand that, that person right there, and you look at this individual's life, and you see that even though he or she claims to be a Christian, there's so much sin, there's so much wrong in their lives that there's no comparison at all. They're as opposite as the day is long. Well, the same thing could be said of the other points that we made. Uh, insofar as being a church member, I could have my name on the roll of some congregation, uh, and yet that does not prove that I am actually putting forth the things necessary to be just like Jesus Christ. It's, it's not, not me living up to the highest expectations that have ever been levied. Stop and think about it for a moment. We're looking at one who was perfectly sinless. We're looking at one who was deity in the flesh. We're looking at one who never, ever did anything in contradiction to the will of God. Can any of us say that other than the little children? Well, of course not. We remember the words of Paul in Romans chapter 3 and 23. Romans 3 and 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, what wearing the name Christian really means the honor of wearing the name. And it is an honor. There's no greater honor. I am honored to be an American. But I am more honored to be a Christian. I am honored to be a transplanted Texan. For you guys, that this means so much to. I'm honored in that area. But not as honored as being a Christian. I am honored in so many different areas. I'm honored to be able to be involved with the school of preaching. But that does not compare to the honor of being a Christian. And therefore, my emphasis as I look at my life and as I uh, endeavor to be like Christ and take on that mind of Christ that we've been talking about so far this week, this is going to be something that is going to demand of me my all. This is going to demand of me the commitment that I must be willing to commit to uh, through it all. You know, there's honor and dishonor in a lot of different ways. We think about, and we can go back to the Bible, and we can see certain people that were looked upon in one way or the other at times uh, being dishonored. Uh, uh, Gentiles, for example, Samaritans, uh, uh, and others. But we can also think about the idea of uh, honor that's assigned with certain positions. I'm honored to be a husband. I'm honored to be a father of four faithful children. I'm honored in so many different ways to have had the privilege of being able, most of all though, to become a child of God, a Christian. There's no greater honor. If you took everything else away, as much as I would hate for that to be taken away, you still have not taken my greatest honor away. If you take my wife away, I'm going to miss her. But you've not taken my greatest honor. If you take my children away, I'm going to miss them. But you haven't taken my greatest honor away. Until I allow myself to be robbed of the life of a true Christian, until I do that, then I will never understand the point of the greatest loss that could ever be had in turning away from the Lord. When we look at this, we once again can 
go back to the words of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 16. And we can try to analyze for just a moment in our mind uh, the mindset of these individuals that were there. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 16, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Even when difficulty comes, we're honored to suffer for Christ. If someone walked in this room right now, the doors swang open, and a bunch of armed thugs came in here and lined us up across the auditorium and gave us a choice, deny Christ or die. We have no choice. We're honored to affirm our faith in Christ even to the very point of death. And as such, then, we have to recognize how important it is that we show this sense of, of, of pride, if you would, in being able to say, I am a Christian. I am a Christian. We should never be ashamed of that. We should never allow any circumstance in life. Now, I, I, I've been uh, with these guys in the school uh, and many, many others as we have done campaigns uh, uh, over the last several years in a number of different states and a number of different cities. And I know that oftentimes as you pull up to that first house, it gets easier as the day goes by, but when you pull up to that first house, there's always those butterflies that are there. There's always that sense of, man, do I really want to do that? And yes, we do, because we're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Amen. That's exactly, you remember, what Paul wrote in Romans 1 and 16. And we're not ashamed of the God that is behind that. Notice there, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's not my gospel. It's not Robert's gospel. It's not this congregation's gospel. It's the gospel that has proceeded forth from God Almighty. And because of that, we should not be ashamed in any sense of the word. Vine's Expository Dictionary had this to say about the word Christian. From the second century onward, the term was accepted by believers as a title of honor. And that's exactly what it is. It's a title of honor. There is no greater honor. You know, we, we're in a, a year of where we're going to be voting for a president and whoever it is that ends up in that office will perhaps see that as an honor. But I can tell you right now, it's not as great as an honor as being a Christian. I don't care what political office you might run for, there is no honor greater than the honor of being a child of God. We could be president of the world, and still yet, it would not compare to uh, the point that we're making here. As true Christians, we wear the name not because it's some ordinance of man, not because it's some ordinance of angelic beings, but rather we wear the name uh, of God in whom we seek to glorify. We notice the words of the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians chapter 6 and uh, verse 14. Galatians chapter 6 and verse uh, 14. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. He glorified in the death of Jesus Christ, not that old rugged cross, but what transpired there upon that cross. And it was because of what that death did. It gave us the ability, it gave us the opportunity to be God's child. When we think of this, then we can give some thought to the rewards that are associated with being a Christian. Turn with me back to the book of Matthew chapter 6. We're going to notice a, a familiar passage. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. And as we look at this, we're going to see that we are blessed with material blessings. Notice here, verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus had just talked about food and rail, uh, raiment and shelter and things of that nature, but he came down in summation of it all and said, listen here, none of those things are as important as the kingdom of God. So seek it first. 
we likewise understand how fortunate we are to be benefited by the many physical blessings that come our way. But more importantly, we recognize that as we set the stage, you might say, and pursue the right path in our life in seeking the kingdom of God, getting our priorities as they ought to be, it exemplifies to the world that we are seeking to be like Christ. Stop and ask yourself for just a moment as you look at the life of Jesus and you think about the, the church that was to come and, and what it was that Jesus shed uh, His life's blood for. And as we think about that, we ponder the question, uh, well, just exactly how important did Jesus look upon the church? What, what kind of a level uh, of importance do we see there? And of course, we can turn to the words of Paul. We noticed this passage yesterday. But in the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, Ephesians 5 and 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. He shed His life's blood in order to purchase the church. The church is that composition of the saved. And uh, as such, we uh, who are seeking to be Christians uh, fill that mold, if you would. But in all of that, we understand the spiritual blessings that are associated with that. And what a wonderful privilege, once again, it is to receive or to be the recipient of such <coughs> blessings. Notice with me again in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1 uh, and verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And then if you read on down through verse 14, we'll not do that to save some time, but if you read on down, you'll see that the Apostle Paul had laid out seven different spiritual blessings related to redemption that were received by that one who is in Christ. How important it is that we seek for those blessings. We also understand that we have the promise of heaven. And as we look at the earth that we're living on today, I would think that at least the majority of us would have to not be very happy with what's going on. We look, do we not, for a better place? We look for a place wherein uh, there will be the happiness that we're looking for that it just seems to be that we can't find. We look for a place wherein we can actually achieve the peace that we look for that we just can't find. We look for a place where we can have the security, where we can have the hope, where we can have all of these things uh, uh, that we're just simply unable to obtain in this life. And then we notice the words of Jesus in John chapter 14. John chapter 14, we begin with verse 1 and read through verse 4. John 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. What a wonderful promise that is as we stop and think about the promise of eternity in heaven with God. And that prepared place that we see there is a place that has been prepared for those who are Christians. Those that are outside of Christ, those who do not believe, I have no hope in that realm. Let's back up just a little bit in the same book of John to John chapter 8 and verse 24. John 8 and 24. Jesus stated, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am He, you shall die in your sins. What a tragic uh, situation it is when people turn their backs, you might say, on God and refuse to believe in Him or to believe in the Lord. Uh, we ran across a couple of those individuals today. One individual took the literature that was put on the door, threw it on the ground, and when it was picked up by Michael, the person said something to the effect, I don't want anything to do with your God. How tragic that is. And he may think that things are all well and good today in his life by doing this, 
But I can assure you, come the judgment day, he is going to find himself wishing that on this day he would have come and would have obeyed the gospel rather than doing what he did. We turn to the words of the Apostle Paul to the Thessalonian brethren in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And we're going to begin uh, with verse 6. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning with verse 6. Seeing it's a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation, tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Friends, that's why we're here this week. To try to help people eliminate that being their destiny. That's why we're out there walking up and down the street, handing out literature, talking to those who will talk, giving them information on the church. That's why Robert tomorrow is going to be following up on uh, the contacts that have already been made because we want to eliminate as many as is possible from this situation that we have just read about. And in order for that to be, they're going to have to take on that mind of Christ. They're going to have to take on that attitude of Christ. They're going to have to be displaying in their life day in and day out the Christ-likeness that is so important in our lives. As we've already seen, heaven is a, a prepared place for a prepared people. But as we said last night, hell is a, a prepared place for an unprepared people. But we do not have to be in that category. We are given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity in order to submit ourselves in obedience to the gospel. If we choose not to, then like Agrippa uh, that we read earlier, how tragic the end result is going to be. Wearing the name Christian means uh, assuming the responsibility as a disciple. And as such, we're going to seek to learn. We're going to seek to learn what it is that we ought to be doing in order to be like Him. I've got to know Him to try to be like Him. If I don't know Him, I can't try to be like Him. My oldest son is a, a, a sports nut. He can tell you this coach and this player and this coach and this player, and every once in a while, uh, he forgets that I don't care one thing at all about sports. <laughs> and he'll mention somebody by the name, and I look at him and I think, son, I have the foggiest idea who you're talking about. But he talks about this individual uh, in a way where, uh, for one reason or the other, this person has actually risen above the normal. It's kind of like, uh, here's a good example. Well, I don't know that because I don't know anything about the guy. I don't know anything about him. But you know, I could if I wanted to. I just don't want to. But when it comes to the Lord, we can, we can once again, we can do all things that God would have us to do if we will just do it, if we will step up and do what God wants us to do. It can get done in our lives. But we're going to have to expend the effort in order to do so. We, as a child, are going to seek to obey. As children of God, we're going to seek always to be obedient to those things that God would have us to do in order to be, once again, displaying the Christ-likeness that needs to be there. We think about Jesus once again while He was here on earth. And we look at His life and we examine and never once do we see Him telling the Father, I'm not going to do what you want me to do. Even in the garden before his betrayal, he prayed time after time after time, if it be possible, let this cup pass. But if not, then let thy will be done. And he was willing to submit himself even to the cross, the old rugged cross that we sing about from time to time. Wearing the name Christian means that as a servant, we're going to seek to be loyal in our servitude to God. 
Because when we look at the life of Jesus and we remember that He didn't come to be served, He didn't come to be ministered to, but rather to serve or to be ministering to others, He set us an example wherein we can follow that example and show the Christ-likeness that we need to be showing. As we think of this, how can we determine how can we determine whether or not we're really a Christian? Just quickly, let's ask a few questions and answer them, and then we'll conclude. Number one, did I become a Christian uh, from convenience or conviction? And what I mean by that is, is that was I simply challenged by a family member? You know, Bob, you ought to become a Christian. Okay. I don't know what that means. That was the foggiest idea, but you said, Mom, you said I ought to do it, so okay, I'll do it. Dad, you said I ought to do it, okay, I'll do it. Have no idea why. No conviction at all. No desire at all to actually be a Christian. We just followed through with certain things that were supposed to make us a Christian. But what we have to understand is, is just like going on a trip, you're not done till you're finished. And we may start that path right in obeying the gospel, but we're not done yet. We have to, every day of our lives, keep on developing that Christ-likeness that God would have us uh, to do so. Am I separated from the world uh, in my recreation, in my language, in my literature, and things of that nature? We remember uh, the words of, of John in 1 John chapter 2. Uh, verse 15 and uh, through 17. First John chapter 2, verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You see, good people, we've got to make a choice. We can't love them both. We've got to make that uh, decide, decision in our lives and then live accordingly. Number three, am I really devoted to the church? Am I seeking first, as we talked about earlier, the kingdom of God and His righteousness? Uh, or have I turned against the things that God would have us uh, to do? Do I appreciate strong preaching? The men who will stand up and preach the whole counsel of God with love and conviction? Or uh, do I wish that they would compromise on the Word of God just to make me have some warm, fuzzy feelings? I can promise you warm, fuzzy feelings are not going to get you into heaven. The Word of God will. The truth that has been given unto us will. Am I trying to save the lost as God would have me to do? Uh, and if not, then we have to stop and look at our lives. Three facts regarding the wearing of the name and then we're finished. We're to wear, number one, we're to wear it voluntarily. You know, I really didn't have a choice about being an American per se when I was born because I was born here. My parents were American, and voila, I'm an American. There I am. I'm an American. I'm an Ohioan. I'm a Buckeye. Um, all of those things. There I was. Uh, as such, whenever we become a Christian, though, we make a choice. We choose which path we're going to pursue. We wear it consistent. We wear the name and see the, uh, the action, the demeanor on a consistent basis. Christianity is not just something that we do inside this building. It is something that we do and something that we are in this building, but it goes beyond that uh, as we look at our lives. Christianity is a daily matter. We, you remember in Luke chapter 9 and 23 how that we're to take up our cross daily and follow Him? That means Monday, that means Tuesday, that means Wednesday, that means Thursday, that means Friday, that means Saturday, that means Sunday. Yes, indeed. And then we ought to wear the name intelligently. In other words, we ought to know why it is uh, that we're wearing the name, what it means. It's not enough to just say, I'm a Christian. We need to be living that and knowing why we're living it. That's going to come from our actually daring to open this book up and examining it as God would have us to do so. If you're here tonight and not a Christian, we're going to sing the invitation song that was selected. Robert will be up here to assist you. In order to become a Christian, you need to obey the gospel. 
Obeying the gospel involves believing in Jesus as the Son of God, believing in God. It involves our repenting of our sins. It involves our confession of our faith in Christ. And it involves our being baptized into Christ to have our sins washed away by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Having done that, then we're set on that straight and narrow road toward eternity to be with God. But then the work begins. The work of endeavoring to be the Christian that God wants us to be every day from there on out until the end. Maybe we've not done that. Maybe we've already obeyed the gospel, but maybe we have turned and cast a wishful eye upon the world. And as such, we need to be restored back to faithfulness. We do that by confessing our sin and praying that that might be forgiven. If you need to respond in any way, we would encourage you to, and we would invite you to, as we stand and sing. Oh, to be like.